Good. Good morning, everybody. So we are going to start the session three, which is about health promotion and social determinants of health equity in the COVID-19 times. And my name is Eugenio Villar, and I'm going to start uh, with a brief introduction on the subject, especially related to Latin America and in Peru in particular. And then we will have three interventions from our colleagues from different regions. Uh, and then at the end, we will have another live intervention from our colleague from the Pan American Health Organization. After that, which, which should be about 45 minutes, then we are going to have about 50 minutes for questions and comments. So without any further ado, I'm going to start talking to you about health promotion and the social determinants of health during the COVID pandemic with a special reference to Latin America and to Peru. I'm going to start talking to you about some uh, reflections on some of the contributory factors of the zoonosis of the pandemic. And this, of course, from a social determinants of health perspective. First of all, an important contributory factor has been the responsible, the risky, intensive agriculture and animal husbandry models due to an increase in meat demand worldwide. A second factor has been also the massive deforestation, the invasion of wild animal space, which has contributed also, which is contributing also to climate change. A third one is the animal farming and slaughtering houses, which uh, have, are very overcrowded, both in terms of animals and in terms of people that work on them. Another factor is unregulated and prohibited wild animal trade, which as you know is in many countries forbidden, but is not properly enforced, that prohibition. Then we have another factor, which is the weak epidemiological capacities to anticipate, prepare, and detect and report on time on any outbreak. And finally, another factor has been, of course, the huge, the international mobility of people and goods in a globalized world, which has made the virus circulate quite soon worldwide. Now I'm going to talk about some important factors and especially about the inequalities, which were of course very high worldwide before the pandemic started and that the pandemic has actually escalated those inequities. And I'm going to show you some uh, city maps of Latin America, which actually show the degree of the inequalities that COVID has brought. Here you can see, for instance, the map of the Mexico City, you know, where you see the different colors and intensity of reds from less to high mortality of COVID. And this map, of course, reflects uh, also the socioeconomic status and other factors and other social determinants of health in Mexico City, which of course have been at the very basis of the increase of the cases. So you can see the different colors, the different uh, degrees of the disease depending on the, of the socioeconomic status of the population in, those, in that city. In the same way you see on the left, the map of Bogota in Colombia, same thing. And at the right hand side, you will see the map of Buenos Aires, where you can see also the different intensities, the different degrees of mortality uh, due to COVID, which reflect the socioeconomic status and the social determinants of health. I'm showing you now a very initial analysis that has been done in the country regarding the inequity, regarding the cases of COVID. And this is information from our system of deaths, death registration in Peru. You can see the red dots in this graph, you know, and the yellow dots below, which show before the, the line that says quarantena there, which really is the beginning of the pandemic, that we always had, of course, in the red dots, the mortality on people with high school or less education, which is a proxy of socioeconomic status. And below, you see the blue dots of the people dying before the pandemic uh, with higher education, which is a proxy of higher socioeconomic status. And you can see very abruptly from the beginning of the, of the pandemic and the quarantine, you know, how the mortality of those uh, less educated people, you know, really escalated very quickly. Uh, as opposed to a very little 
increase in the mortality of those with a higher education. So you can see here the gap that has been generated by the pandemic in terms of mortality due to the COVID pandemic and the underlying determinants of health. Here you can see also another analysis done by uh, Dr. Cordero. It's also a preliminary analysis, which is showing on the left-hand side, you know, the three graphs you see there is the national excess of mortality uh, during COVID-19 uh, times, and that's the red uh, line, uh, which is in the top. And then the, the blue line, you know, showing the, the mortality that is not due to COVID. And you can see there the gap, the yellow gap, you know, 148% more, more, more mortality nationwide uh, by COVID than before. You see the, the one that is below Lima Metropolitana, which is the capital of the country, 265% more mortality during COVID. And you see the rest of the country, the graph below, showing the gap, the yellow gap, you know, 102% more mortality due to COVID than before. On the right-hand side, you see a display of five uh, socioeconomic status of Lima, the capital, and you see the group A, the richest, and the group E, the poorest of the population and the districts. And you can see how also in this case, you can see very clearly how in the richest uh, districts, you have seen 147, 147% higher mortality than before due to COVID, and in the poorest one, 456% more mortality in the poorest districts, showing how poverty in this case and other socioeconomic factors are behind, of course, the huge, huge increase in mortality due to COVID pandemic. Um, I'm going to share now with you also some information, some analysis that has been done by Professor Michael Marmot and this is courtesy of him actually, showing the rate of COVID-19 deaths by ethnic group and sex rela rela relative to the white ethnic group. So all these groups are comparison with the white ethnic group in um, England and Wales. And you can see on the left-hand side, the male graphs, please look at the yellow, dark yellow uh, bars, and you will see that the ethnic groups that blacks other ethnic groups, Pakistanis and Indians and mixed, all of them have, of course, higher proportion of deaths as compared with the white population in England and Wales. And this, of course, is higher in the male population than in the female population that is a graph on your right hand side. This just to, to show that ethnic um, factors are also related to uh, mortality in COVID. Um, as we can see everywhere. Here, I'm showing you also another analysis done from Professor Michael Marmot, showing in this case, uh, socioeconomic status and showing, you know, the size of socioeconomic status on the left-hand side, the richest on the right-hand side, the poorest ones. And you can see how, uh, and, and you see the, 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 blue, the blue columns, which show the COVID-19 deaths and the more um, uh, gray columns, that means all deaths. And you can see here in all the different uh, socioeconomic designs. First of all, you see that in the, in the poorer uh, uh, designs, socioeconomic designs, you see that there has been always a higher mortality, both before the pandemic and with the pandemic, you know? But you can see also another thing here that you saw also in the, in the data that I showed from Lima, that in the poorest socioeconomic sectors, the, the death mortality has, has been proportionally higher, meaning that COVID has had a proportionally higher impact in the poorer uh, socioeconomic groups, in this case, in England and Wales. Now I'm going to show you some reflections from myself on the situation that we have seen in Peru. Very unfortunately, my country, and we will see the reasons, it's not a matter of luck, but, but, but real socioeconomic reasons, Peru has been unfortunately leading worldwide the mortality uh, in COVID. And these are some of the explanations that we are discussing here in Peru regarding why is this the case. 
We need to say that Peru, as you may know, has been one of the stars in Latin America regarding GDP growth. So we have been growing even higher than Chile, you know. Um, so we have been quite proud to see ourselves as a country supposedly, you know, almost going to reach the OECD, you know. However, the pandemic has brought us to reality by this huge mortality that we have had leading globally. And this, according to our perspectives, are because of the historical and structural inequalities that has been always in our country and that have not been reduced by economic growth. This also implies that we have a huge informality, 72% of our workforce is informal, you know, and that uh, multidimensional poverty is also very high. We have seen a reduction in monetary poverty, but multidimensional poverty has been always very high despite macroeconomic successes. Another factor also is that we have had a lot, a lot of savings, what we were saying, a very fat financial shoulders. However, the investments in health and education have been during this period of economic growth, very little and very badly done. Another factor is also the weak and uncoordinated national, regional and district governance with very poor leadership. Another factor is that we have had historically under investments in the health systems, with no preparedness of the system, and also very hospitally oriented, curatively oriented, with no primary health care, and very extremely weak first level health care. Our government has also managed the situation of the pandemic in a very government centered fashion without really social participation, community participation, private sector participation, and therefore the capacities of the state were very weak in order to really implement the actions that were planned. And also another factor is the weak and uncoordinated public in education and communication. You know, we have hardly been able to reach the whole country and the population with messages that could really allow to prevent contagion and also uh, for the people to seek care, you know, when they really need it. Now, what to do about this situation, which I'm sure is not common only to Peru. I think these socioeconomic and social determinants of health factors are really common worldwide, including the rich countries. What we can do now, we believe that health promotion has a lot to do, and, but we need to approach also health promotion from a social determinant of health perspective, which is, which is something that during the last decades, health, the traditional health promotion has evolved to a social determinants of health perspective too. And here I'm showing a graph that is already known, uh, made by Fran Baum originally, when you can see an iceberg and in the surface you see the disease and the lifestyle risk factors, which in the traditional conception of health promotion has been really the things that we need to tackle and that's perfectly fine. However, many times in that traditional view, we have forgotten or we haven't seen that deep and important social determinants of health that underlie the disease and the life's risk factors. Whether they are daily living uh, conditions, which are the so-called intermediate determinants of health, or whether they are the deeper economic and social structural determinants of health. So I want you to keep this in mind for the uh, suggestions that we are making in terms of how to address and reduce health inequities due to COVID-19 pandemic, but also to going beyond to reduce health inequities that are structural in many of our countries. And I would say also in, in the global, in the global uh, setting. So here's some suggestions. Uh, in the short term, we have suggested that health literacy on preventing contagion is really very important, has been neglected as I said, and needs to be in place if we want people to be able to confront the risks and prevent contagion. In the short term also to uh, implement uh, contact tracing, which hasn't been implemented properly in many of our countries, and to address the hotspots, control them, which are mainly the markets, transportation, family gathering, etc. On the third place, we need to do the economic opening, which has been very advocated by the business sector, rightly so, I suppose, because nobody wants the economy to be weak. To be weak. However, this needs to be done with rigorous epidemiological contagion control strategies 
because there is no dichotomy between health and the economy. Both need to be together, and we are going to have a strong economy to the extent that we have a good health for everybody. And therefore, the two things need to be implemented simultaneously and with respect of each other, having the health of the people being the most important factor, of course. Then we need to strengthen the first level healthcare, the so-called primary care level, with social participation, not only focusing on improving intensive care units, which has been mainly the case in most of our countries, and taking due care of our staff with proper PPE and also implementing telemedicine. In the short term, we need also to ensure economic protection and food provision for our poor and to promote popular kitchens and popular participation because our poor know very well how to protect themselves. It's not the first time they are confronting crisis, but they need support. And this has been hardly being organized in the extent that we need it. Then we need in the short term also to prepare, ensure financial, financially uh, equitable vaccine access. So the vaccine is going to come hopefully in some months time and we need to ensure that everybody has got it irrespective of their capacity to pay. They need to be free of charge in order to have an equitable uh, impact in the pandemic. And also we need to ensure you know, that some functions of the system you know, need to be decentralized and implemented at the local level. And some of them need to be centralized because they need a, a national um, sort of uh, leadership. In the medium to long term, we need to do many actions. First of all, to ensure that not only economic growth prospers, but also there is social and, and equitable distribution of that economic growth in order to eradicate multidimensional poverty, to reduce inequities, and to protect the environment, which as we know, is essential. And in this sense, we may need to update or amend the SDGs. This has been already some talks in the UN to be able to do this. Then we need to create and strengthen social protection systems, you know, which I'm talking about employment, housing, pensions, education, to reduce inequities by addressing the social determinants of health and to promote equitable well-being. A health system alone is unable to deal with the social determinants of health as such. Therefore, social protection is what is really needed and it's not in place. Then we need to promote public administration reforms that can facilitate effective intersectoral action. Health in all policies is not going to be a reality with the, with the balkanized uh, government sectors that we have got without communication among themselves. We need to have systems that can horizontally promote intersectoral action in order to address determinants of health. Then we need to have, of course, financial tax reforms in order to make everybody to pay for the public goods and the public actions that need to be in place. At this time in our countries, particularly in Peru, we have a very regressive tax system that rich pay very little, if anything, and the poor are the ones that really pay the taxes, and therefore we never have enough fiscal space to be able to fund the activities that we need. We need also to reform and recreate a universal health system, as I mentioned before, based on primary health care that is more needed than than before and leading to intersectoral action. And we need to eradicate discrimination and racism and colonialism that is still in place in our countries. With this, I finish my presentation and I will uh, give uh, the initiative to our colleagues to put in place the, the other presentations. Okay, go ahead colleagues, please. I want to thank the Alliance for Health Promotion for the kind invitation to share with you how the cooperatives that make up this Pru Foundation have done and continue to do to face the COVID-19 pandemic and the actions taken to reduce its impact on health equity. I also want to show my appreciation to Health Nexus for their support to carry out this 10 Global Health Forum that under normal conditions should have been held in Ottawa. Within these days, the global recorded cases of COVID-19 may surpass 40 million. The world saw its official COVID-19 death toll break the 1 million barrier. These figures are higher than the annually recorded for other infectious diseases, such as malaria, 
tuberculosis and HIV, which have been long time and one of the world biggest killers. According to the WHO data, Spain is among the 10 countries that count both more confirmed cases and fatalities. Since late January, when the first patient was diagnosed, uh, cases have been trending upwards. Since mid-March and to the end of May, the government implemented a strict lockdown to control the spread of the virus. At the peak of the infection, there were more than 900 dead daily, intensive care wards filled up quickly, and some hospitals were in the verge of collapse. In late May and June, the situation got somewhat better, and the daily number of infected cases uh, reduced. Unfortunately, since mid-July, figures are growing again. So far, they have been more than 770,000 uh, confirmed cases. Some 150,000 has been admitted in hospitals. More than 30, 13,000 have needed intensive care. And regretfully, near 32,000 patients have died. We should not forget that beyond those figures, there are people so they represent a lot of suffering. We at SPRIU keep working hard every day to care for our community and our members. Before getting down to the experience of SPRIU in tackling the pandemic, I want to share with you a few details about the organization. SPRIU Foundation is a network of health cooperatives, hospitals, medical centers, insurance companies, diagnostic units, technology companies, etc., caring for 2.6 million people in Spain. Per year, we registered 30 million consultations, 419,000 surgeries, 540,000 emergency services. The whole group brought together more than 180,000 cooperators, directly employed more than 6,000 people, and achieved a turnover of 1.6 billion euros. SPRIU offers complete health services to their customers and members in 16 hospitals from around Spain. 32 multi-speciality third medical centers and in partnership with more than uh, 45,000 health professionals. Over more than 60 years, Spears cooperatives have developed a non-profit health model based on the reinvestment of any surplus in knowledge, technology and infrastructure to improve the healthcare quality. We have consolidated a strong public-private partnership with the national health system and also develop a governance model for multi-stakeholders cooperatives, where doctors and patients share the decision-making process. The unprecedented health emergency we have faced over the past months has compelled SPRIU cooperatives to completely reorganize their healthcare services to be able to treat more than 12,000 COVID-19 patients. Once again, the cooperative model demonstrated its resilience. Thanks to the professionalism and commitment of the healthcare workers and all cooperative members and employees, we were able to handle the crisis. All the actions developed by SPRIU have been implemented following the guidelines issued by the World Health Organization and the Spanish health authorities. Since the very beginning, we have been cooperating at all levels with the public health system. Thousands of COVID-19 patients have been admitted in the cooperative hospitals, where at the early stage of the pandemics, they had a priority because all non-urgent interventions were postponed. Medical consultation became virtual and we launched a new system of telemedicine and remotely delivered healthcare. Hospitals restructured their facilities and protocols, increasing their capacity in place. They create new intensive care units with a several fall increase in some cases and reassign professionals and tasks. Regarding employment, SPRIU cooperatives prove resilient and choose not to make any workforce, workforce reductions and facilitated to non-health workers and staff switch on, switching to remote working as insurance, their health and safety become a priority. Currently, more than 70% of non-health care workers can work from home and at the hardest days of the pandemic, they were up for over to the 90%. In the healthcare area, additional medical and nursing staff have been taken on to meet the increasing demand. Health professionals of hospitals where the situation was not too bad hard 
went to help other centers overwhelmed by increasing admission of COVID-19 patients, sometimes in cities long away from the home. The some retired doctors came back to lend a helping hand. It's not the, that the people are the worthiest set of economic, social economic enterprises. At the Spreeu cooperatives, they were the main driving force behind the fight against COVID-19. We will never appreciate their unconditional commitment and professionalism enough. Uh, paradoxically, many medical doctors have seen their practice close several weeks because of the lockdown. They have been unable to generate income to pay workers and bills. The Sprius Cooperative launched an aid program aimed at help doctors to handle these financial issues. The concern for the community is one of the central values of Sprio. In that sense, we create a specific free telephone advice service addressed to all citizens. A team of the organization healthcare professionals, most of them voluntarily, provide guidance and clear it coronavirus queries. To help people to cope with the lockdowns, we launched the website called Ahora Más Que Nunca Tranquilidad.es, meaning keep calm, now more than ever. It compiles helpful content concerning exercise, nutrition, mental health, sleep and working from home, backed up by health professionals. Cooperatives also set up flexibility plans, allowing clients and users affected by unemployment or income cuts as a result of the economic effects of COVID-19 to postpone the monthly payments. Doctors, nurses and all health workers were in the front line in the hardest situations. They were working many hours under psychological strain to combat the coronavirus. Unfortunately, some of them have been affected by the disease. The cooperative launched a psychological support program helping professionals to provide them with the tools to manage the emotional stress generated by the emergency and protect their mental strength. Spru cooperatives also join forces with other Spanish firms to protect healthcare workers combating coronavirus by contributing to a solidarity fund set up at the insurance sector to cover them and their families. And which are the lessons learned from the pandemic? From my point of view, probably it's too early to get conclusions. It might be best to deep analyze to this health crisis with a little when a little time has passed. However, after several months struggling with the pandemic, we have some conclusion. The COVID-19 pandemic has magnified the persistent vulnerabilities and inequalities of our health care systems. Although governments have put a wide range of policies in place to combat the pandemic impact of public health, the scale of the challenge requires more. The joint, the joint and coordinated participation of all health resources, whatever public or private, is vital. Now more than ever, we need a concerted effort by all actors in the health sector. Health cooperatives are useful, a useful complement to health systems. In some countries, they even take the place of the national health system. Many times, they fill gaps that otherwise would have been unattended. Therefore, cooperatives are a great ally of governments to develop health systems and improve access to health care of the citizens. Another key takeaway from the pandemic is that professionals are the wealthiest assets of the healthcare sectors. As the so-called second wave approaches and the healthcare demand increases again, the lack of well-trained and motivated healthcare workers becomes an evidence. Improvements in health provision, in healthcare provision often can be reached if resources are pooled and health professionals enjoy better working conditions. Since many years, health cooperatives demonstrated their appropriateness to combining workers' skills and financial resources to bridge the gaps in the provision of health care services. Finally, I want to mention digital technologies. Telemedicine, already undergoing rapid growth, has quickly become a key tool for both preliminary COVID-19 screening and also for non-urgent care and consultations. Health professionals has also have taken advantage of digital communication tools to quickly share information on how to deal with the COVID-19 patients. Uh, some of the developments that would have taken years to be implemented are already working as the coronavirus emergency has been a catalyst that has pushed them up. Last 
but not least, we should learn to avoid making policy in times of pandemic and leave the management of this kind of situation to the experts. We will likely reach better results. Thank you very much. And that's all. If you want to have an, uh, something to, to say, I will be waiting. My name is Miriam Kangu. I'm the co-chair for Health Promotion Alliance Cameroon. Health Promotion Alliance Cameroon was officially registered in Cameroon as of August 2020. That's just two months ago. The idea was conceived in August 2019 at the Cooperating for Health Promotion Workshop in Kitali, Kenya. At the workshop in Kitali, we discussed the concept of health promotion and the relevance of the concept in Africa at large. We equally identify the importance of scaling up the Kitali model in Cameroon. With guidance from the president of the Alliance for Health Promotion in Geneva, Health Promotion Alliance of Kenya, and with support from the Dennis and Lenora Forretier Foundation in Cameroon, Health Promotion Alliance Cameroon became historic, co-chaired co by Miriam Kangu and Dr. Dennis Forretier with the primary goal of fighting for the opportunity for every citizen to live a healthy life. The first case of COVID-19 in Africa was reported in Egypt on February 14 and in Cameroon on March 6. Our partner, the Encavo Policy Institute, swiftly created a coronavirus task force in March following the first reported case in Cameroon. The Encavo Policy Institute organized a series of webinars with economic and health leaders across Africa, highlighting some of the effects of COVID-19 on Africa's economy with massive decline of activities and serious economic impact on Africa's growing middle-class economy. And this is threatening to increase poverty and extreme poverty. Measures like physical distancing, hand washing can be very challenging in most parts of Africa. These measures are compounded in conflicts and humanitarian settings like Cameroon, With constant lockdown in some regions, lack of trust in the system affects effective risk communications, shutdown and limited online infrastructures to ensure continuity, limited supply of basic services like soap, water, reliance of the population on the informal sector, women and their small businesses that help sustain families and livelihoods interrupted, reduce access to social network, increase stress in men and domestic violence. Equitable access to basic health services and a focus on equitable outcome is central to challenging health inequities. For example, the distribution of buckets and soap for essential and basic hygiene to combat COVID-19 in rural and some urban areas without consideration of access to water supply is very challenging. These challenging inequities in social conditions often leads to health inequalities. Lockdown in these countries that rely mostly on the informal sector and subsistence agriculture implies increased poverty, rising inequality in income and assets, and social exclusion. All this continues to widen and deepen health inequalities. With poor welfare policy, lockdown without immediate social protection package to help mitigate its effects only continues to widen the inequality gap. Though individuals may be largely responsible for their own health and can help improve their health through better health behaviors, but the determinants, the underlying determinants of health can either make it easier or difficult for individuals to make changes to their health. The existence of a weak health system, increased poverty, limited equipment, access to food, insufficient trained healthcare personnel, inefficient data to monitor transmission and surveillance and challenges on taking actions on social determinants of health can be sometimes political. And therefore it is important to understand and improve the determinants of our behaviors in order to reduce health inequalities and improve health. Fundamentally, Health promotion is geared towards addressing inequalities. 
post COVID-19 therefore requires investment in health promotion and primary health care. COVID-19 has exposed the aftermath of limited investment on primary health care and disparities in resource distribution within countries in rural and urban areas. For example, the imposed lockdown globally impeded access to the wealthiest population as they are unable to access high quality health care abroad. This therefore left all the nationals with the challenge of using their health infrastructures and equipment that they have built over the years. Given such situations, the poor continues to suffer the effect more because it has a negative trickle-down effect as it affects access to the limited resources due to increased demand with limited supply. This should therefore be seen as an opportunity and a sound reality check for most African nations, health professionals, health systems and decision makers, development agencies to coordinate their efforts and prioritize their agenda more on need assessment as opposed to what they want. The need for governments to work with all sectors of the economy to address these underlying determinants of health is important because the government alone cannot help fix the health of the people and individuals. It requires a collective action. Thank you and thank you to our partners. Hello everyone, I'm Oneira Amroni. I'm a final year medical student from Egypt and I'm currently the liaison officer for public health issues for the International Federation of Medical Students Association, representing the voice of more than 1.3 million medical students from around the world. I'm here to share about, about what IFMC has been doing to address the health inequities related to the pandemic. So allow me to share my screen. To begin with, IFMSA has developed its own COVID-19 response since the beginning of the pandemic in March. The aim of the response strategy is to address all the health inequities that are seen both on a country level and on a global level by our medical students worldwide. So we decided to create a database that had all the WHO and CDC awareness materials and educational um, uh, documents in seven different languages in order to ensure that all the information that is available that is correct and fact checked is available to all medical students from around the world in all the languages so that they can then use this kind of information and raise awareness within their own community and empower them with the knowledge to protect and promote their health in the face of the pandemic. In addition, we have developed more than 20 global partnerships, including partnerships with the WHO, the UN Youth Envoy Office, UNICEF, Global Climate and Health Alliance, the Alliance for Health Promotion, and finally, UNFPA. In addition, we have conducted a series of webinars, over 30 webinars that had an outreach of over 10,000 um, uh, members around the world that also were equipped uh, with the knowledge to address COVID-19 from the help of our global experts from all the partnerships that we have developed. One of the initiatives that I really want to highlight, which really helped us address such health inequities that are um, that result from lack of access to information, we collaborated with the United Nations um, Population Fund, the UNFPA, and Prezi, and we developed a series of interactive videos uh, in multiple languages for young people in order for them to protect themselves and to use to spread the right information to their family, friends, and communities. These uh, videos were recreated and filmed by anyone with the available scripts that we provided in many, in many different languages that we also also translated along with other youth-led organizations and UNFPA. And these had an outreach of over 10,000 K around the world, and they were recreated over 500 times. As well as 
we realized that the health inequities that were multiplied by COVID-19 were also making us more vulnerable to further global crises, including the climate crisis. And that is why we joined the WHO and the Global Climate and Health Alliance. And we signed on an open letter that was signed by over 35 million healthcare professionals around the world. And this letter was addressed to the G20 head of states ahead of the G20 meeting to call on world leaders to really invest and put public health at the heart of the COVID-19 post-pandemic recovery efforts and stimulus packages, placing not just health, but also the health of the environment in order to build our resilience against the uh, looming climate crisis. In addition, on a global level, we were really addressing the health inequities, but we also made sure that we're addressing it on a country level. That is why we have over 75 activities led by medical students and young healthcare professionals to combat COVID-19 and address the health inequities within their community. This is a map on our IFMSA page that shows the 75 activities. You can click on each activity and see each details. I would like to share a few of them that were very inspiring. The first one is done by a group of medical students in Venezuela. They created a series of COVID-19 stories for children and parents to answer all their questions. While in Lebanon, more than 200 medical students volunteered in national call centers to answer all COVID-related questions and follow up on home quarantine. While in Bangladesh, students facilitated mental health capacity building workshops in order to help medical students both at home and at the front line, as well as other members within the community to really cope with the stress and the anxiety that they felt during the pandemic. These are other examples and we have created a designated folder for all the efforts that are led by medical students and many of them happen in partnerships with country level organizations such as the WHO country offices, the Red Crescent and so on. Many of the initiatives that they did were more on a virtual platform in their own country's languages in order to ensure that the information is accessible and there were many activities that were done on the ground so that it is the populations that are offline and the communities are able to access the information related to COVID. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send them on my email. Hello, everyone. My name is Shum Gates, and I'm the president of the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation, so the leading international advocacy organization representing pharmacy students and recent graduates worldwide. It's a pleasure to have been invited to speak about uh, the work of IPSF and our member organizations in health promotion and also social determinants of health. So IPSF uh, during these past months has developed very various strategies to support our member organizations uh, that include students, student associations from all over the world, including low and middle income countries. Uh, we have been, they have been supporting our efforts in mental health, in particular our IPSF European Regional Office that promoted different ways to manage your mental health during the, the COVID pandemic, ensuring to take into account activities that can be easily done and accessible to all. So activities like walking, uh, exercising outside with little or no equipment, reading or uh, doing simple hobbies. This way we are uh, promoting different activities that the students can do and that can be available to everyone. Also, we have provided practical soft skills training from our professional development portfolio. Uh, so we can help students to manage their workload and mental health during this time. Also, um, IPSF was seeing a lot of great efforts from our member organizations and we will uh, st stand out some of the contributions from our member organizations, especially the ones in low and middle income countries. So the Lebanese Pharmaceutical Students Association uh, the member organization of IPSF in Lebanon was training with the Lebanese Red Cross under the supervision of the Minister of Higher Education and also the Minister of Public Health and UNICEF and with the Lebanese Medical Students International Committee to really um, provide and participate in training se sessions to that have the opportunity to spread awareness about the, vir the virus to different municipalities in Lebanon. Uh, they were hoping to reach the biggest number of people and really stand up to all together to uh, uh, fight against such a crisis. Pharmacy students from KEFSA Kenya, so our students organization in Kenya, developed affordable ventilators that can be used for patients. 
with um, severe symptoms of COVID-19. Members in Senegal facilitated blood don donations with close to 1,000 bags being collected during this activity. The National Association of Pharmacy Students in Sierra Leone um, has also been involved in infections, infectious disease awareness and training since the West Africa Ebola outbreak from 2014 to 2016. They are currently participating in television talks and shows to really try to increase awareness and educate the public about COVID-19, in addition to conducting online training sessions to their members. Lastly, in El Salvador, our member organization started the process of production of alcohol gel and sanitizing solution from the Faculty of Chemistry and Pharmacy, the University of El Salvador. For a full week, professors and students from this faculty worked on the production of more than 2,000 liters of sanitizing solution that will be then be uh, distributed free of charge in conjunction with the World Vision and also um, be available to the university's community, community and also disadvantaged people. This will also be uh, delivered to the Ministry of Transportation so it can be used in public health trans public transport units. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, morning, evening, everybody. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here on behalf of the Pan American Health Organization, Regional Often of the World Health Organization, talking about health promotion and social determinants of health. Um, so I'm going to focus on the Americas. Uh, we already heard from uh, Eugenio. Um, the socioeconomic context when COVID arrived was already complicated. The huge inequalities, unfortunately, the region of the Americas Key now again is the most inequitable region in the world um, after several months of COVID. 80% of our population lives in cities, which is also very important because you know that a lot of the COVID burden has been in the poor um, uh, inner city, shanty towns, etc. We have an informal economy. We already heard that of over 50%. That varies to some countries that is over 80%. In short, um, a region characterized by exclusion. Um, now, COVID, and we all know that, has magnified, has put the lens, but also deepened uh, those inequalities and those inequities. So what we did in the region, we said, we asked some questions. We said, why, with all those, the implementation of those public health measures that the, the region took, very strict, actually, very quickly, uh, why were they not more effective? And how were the socioeconomic, cultural, political context taken into account uh, when those measures were implemented? And how were the negative consequences taken into account? And how was the heterogeneity uh, of the need of those so the, the various social groups considered when we implemented the measures? And this is very important when we talk about vulnerability, because we need to broaden and to adjust our perspective on the population in vulnerable conditions, which very often comes back to, uh, we, we bring it back to biomedical individual characteristics, the elderly, the women, the children, the ethnic groups, those with uh, chronic diseases, with obesity. But we really need to look at uh, this approach. Um, to, we need to broaden this to take into account the social context. So we came up with this model, and I think it was very helpful for our region. So we looked at, at the, the outer layer, what are those structural um, um, pre-existing um, conditions, uh, the people who are living um, already uh, in, in, in difficult situations in, in with, with inequalities, for example, our informal sector workers. How can you um, stay at home um, and um, not make your daily living? So those populations that were already in a bad situations are actually now worst off. So those inequities now increased. Um, then we go to that second layer uh, where we talk about uh, another level of vulnerability is about not being able to apply those public health measures, you know, um, essential workers. No, they have to go out um, to uh, to do their daily work. This has been constant uh, over the over the, the course of the pandemic. The example of California, we see that 
40% um, of the workers of, in California are Latino, but 80% work in the food business or in agriculture. And we saw in May already that 80% of the hospitalization of COVID were um, Latinos. Uh, and those same people have difficulties in staying at home, difficulties um, uh, doing social distancing because their living conditions do not permit that. They live in crowded spaces, et cetera. Plus they are uh, in fear of losing their jobs. Now then the third level um, looks at additional uh, burden that's being caused by, um, for example, the staying at home or the quarantine measures. We know in, in Latin America, uh, for example, violence against women has gone up very uh, significantly. In Colombia, as almost a 200% increase of violence against women, and that's just an example. Uh, that's, of course, related to confinement, loss of income, and additional care, responsibility, et cetera. And then that last point is where we always hone in on, you know, the, those increased risks for mortality, uh, for people dying once they get COVID um, and due to um, the comor comorbidities, NCDs, et cetera, which again, unfortunately, are disproportionate in poor and excluded populations. So we've seen the labor, the, the conditions of labor are very much defining how the outcome of COVID is. And particularly those who do not have social protection are at much higher risk for getting it and for uh, dying from it. Housing conditions, social exclusion, uh, social support and the burden of care and particular attention to the territories is uh, important here. Um, I, this is the Amazon. We're saying that the indigenous populations um, are, are, indig um, are, are impacted significantly. Yes, but it's also because they live along the rivers, which are the lifelines of, uh, of the people there and they live in very precarious conditions. So it's not only about, you know, race, it's about the conditions they live in. The same here, this is um, a slide, I think if we would have more time, we could go into that. But basically what we're seeing here also in the US that race and ethnicity are risk markers for those underlying conditions that impact health. It's not because I'm black or because I'm indigenous person necessarily I have worse outcomes. It has to do with your living conditions, your access to care, the discrimination, everything that's around that. And this is the last thing I want to do. I want to tell a very brief story. And this is again about Peru. And well, so again, you started there, we ended there too. So we're going to talk about Juan, who comes from this Quechua indigenous village in the Andes, in Peru. He's married with Julia. They come down to the capital Lima with her two children to find better a job and to find better opportunities uh, for everybody. He finds a job in construction, some loose jobs, no social protection, no social security, but he has, he has an income. And Julia finds a job as a help housekeeper for a wealthy family. Uh, their combined income is just enough to cover all the basics. And then COVID hits. The government puts in place very strict quarantine measures. Julia loses her job. Her employer is afraid for her to come in because she might carry COVID. Juan cannot work from home, obviously. Only 25% of people, and this is data from the ILO, can work from home. Uh, but the, the construction continues. So he goes to find work. It's difficult, but he finds some things. The kids stay home from school. They lose their school breakfast. They lose their school lunch. They have difficulties to teleschool, poor internet, only one cell phone, no computer at home. They have difficulties paying the rent. The landlord has already come around a couple of times to knock at their door. Julia goes to the market by bus. It is very crowded bus. Every day she goes because she has no fridge. And she is, of course, afraid to get COVID. If one of them gets COVID, they won't have space in their house to self-quarantine, nor do they have a good access to health care. They don't have a health insurance. Hand washing is difficult. Water only comes twice a week, and it needs to be used for essential, uh, essentials such as cooking. The government has promised financial support, but it's been very, very slow to come. And the neighbors, however, have showed an, an organized and solidarity. And it's only October 2020. What I want to show here that behind all those numbers, behind all that socioeconomic and political suffering that we're seeing is real suffering of people and families and communities. Those key messages, we've seen them. Not everybody could um, um, uh, protect themselves through the measures. It's very important that governments put in place those socioeconomic protection mechanisms, social protection, support services, food, etc. that the community really has a role to play there, that we play in an intersectorial way, 
and that we do, despite all the hardship, we do have an opportunity, a window of opportunity for a more equitable and a healthier future for all. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much, Gary, for your presentation. I would like to have a final word. Unfortunately, we're not going to have enough time to have questions and answers, but please, if you have comments, which we will come and questions, we will be happy to respond them. So please send them to the organizers. I want to thank Carlos, Miriam, Omnia, and Gary for her excellent interventions. I just want to summarize with three points what I have managed to listen from the presentations. First of all, that the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the already very high pre-existing health inequities worldwide, and that COVID has affected then disproportionately the poor and the vulnerable. The good examples that Gary placed uh, in terms of the indigenous peoples is a good example of that. Second, that civil society has been responding with initiatives to tackle those determinants of health that are underlying the bad effects of the COVID pandemics. And these have been done side by side with the government initiatives. And in the third place, I want to say that uh, health promotion within a social determinants of health approach is a key approach to really understand, explain, and act upon the bad impacts of the determinants of health of the COVID pandemic, but also this approach of health promotion and social determinants of health is important for the actions that we will need to organize in the future after this pandemic in order to be able to have a better health equity as a result of this crisis. Okay, with this summary, I will finalize this uh, session. And again, thanking you very much for you uh, for your participation and for listening to us and i look forward to any questions and comments in the, which we will reply of course through the organizers thank you very much <laughs>